Oh, we have Casey Lewis with us this morning. Casey is the uh, pastor and uh, really the founding pastor of Foundation Baptist Church in Euless, Texas. And he formerly was on the pastoral ministry staff and, and doing ministry and youth ministry and other ways at First Baptist Keller. And that's what he was doing when I uh, started working with Keller about coming here. So that's how we became friends and Casey's led uh, Foundation Baptist Church to partner with us in multiple ways. And so Casey and his daughter Addison are here. Addison is in the other class. So glad you're here, Casey. Uh, most of you probably met Casey. So um, just welcome him back. And uh, we decided to send out an email. It's very informal, but if, if you want to uh, have some fellowship time, we're going to have lunch for Casey here in the fellowship hall after the worship meeting. Anybody wants to go get something to bring it back, or maybe you've already brought it, however you planned on it, you're welcome to join us just for time of uh, lunch and fellowship. So I uh, wanted you to have some opportunity for that. Okay, let's start. Uh, maybe, hopefully, don't even have to read this. What does Genesis 1 1 say? That's right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, we're going through our, our doctrinal distinctives here at DRBC. This is a different document than the statement of faith. The statement of faith is what we expect everybody to commit to, to say, yes, I affirm this. What we teach is a little bit different level. This is what everybody should understand. This is what's going to be coming from the pulpit and in classes and that sort of thing. So um, we go into more detail here. And so this document that we're looking at, we've got pulled up. Uh, creation, we believe in the literal six days of creation is the natural and clear reading of Genesis 1. We believe that Adam and Eve are historical figures. And we also have the bouncing words due to other classes upstairs. And we're glad that those people are in those rooms. <coughs> We may not be glad that the words are bouncing while we're trying to read them. But, <laughs> um, they were created by God in the condition of... Sorry, we believe that Adam and Eve are historical figures. Um, it is <clears throat> sad, I think, that we have to say that. But uh, even in the realm of people who claim to believe the Bible, it's necessary for us to make that clear. We don't believe that this is a story to help us understand, <clears throat> we believe this is historical narrative uh, when we read Genesis 1. So we're told what happened. Uh, they were the first human beings created by God. The Lord Jesus spoke of them as if they were. They were created by God in the condition of innocence, were tempted and encouraged into sin by Satan, who uh, came to them in the form of a serpent. The condition of innocence is an important one. Okay, welcome. Welcome. Did y'all feel conviction over making the, the projector bounce? Because when people walk upstairs, we've noticed it makes the words shake because the projector's on our ceiling, your floor. So glad y'all are here. Um, do we need more cheers? affirming that Adam and Eve are historical figures and they were created innocent there's a sense in which they were righteous why do you think it's important maybe for us to say the word innocent instead of righteous were they perfectly righteous how many, pe how many beings in the universe are perfectly righteous in and of themselves yeah, just God. God of course in three persons the Father, Son and Holy Spirit but they were innocent. The difference is, did Adam and Eve have the potential to sin even though they were innocent? They did, didn't they? And then they did sin. God doesn't have the potential to sin. And that's the difference. Okay? So, um, through Adam's sin, all death and creation is the result of the sin of Adam and Eve, Romans 5, 12, and 17. It's very crucial. Through Adam's sin, all of his descendants were made sinners. That's what it says there in Romans 5, 19. 18, uh, through one man's trespass, the many were made sinners. 
uh, that's passive. So it doesn't require that we be born and actually sin before we're put into the category of sinners. Uh, and I think that there are uh, maybe various aspects to how that happens. One is this, though. If God imputes the righteousness of Christ to us, that is a foundational part of our salvation. Well, the way he's doing that is he's appointed a representative for us, and that representative is Jesus. But he's not the only representative. In fact, the first one was Adam, and he represented all of us before God. And we were in him both biologically and federally. He's both our biological head, all of us are biological descendants. He's also our federal head. He was the representative of humanity before God. Jesus is our uh, representative of humanity before God. And he's called the last Adam because of that. It's called the second Adam and the last Adam. So uh, all the sins were made sinners through Adam's sin. And the only remedy is provided by the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the Lord Jesus says, as through his work, the many will be made righteous. Do you see the parallel? Through Adam made sinners, through Christ made righteous. Those are very important categories in Adam and in Christ. Uh, is everybody in the whole wide world in Christ right now? Is everybody in the whole wide world in Adam? Unless, yeah, we start in Adam. Everybody starts in Adam, some by grace through faith, uh, moving into the category of in Christ, and in Christ the many will be made righteous. <clears throat> Now, abandoning the clear reading of creation account in order to harmonize it with certain claims of science, and I put science in, in uh, quotations because there's this notion that is utterly false, uh, that we ought to treat science as if it's some entity that has a headquarters somewhere and it issues decrees on behalf of the smart people. And that's not true. We don't have science. We have scientists. We have scientists and we have scientists who come up with consensus because they go and they talk and, and they're all people and they all have a problem. They start in Adam and the only possibility for them to be righteous is in Christ. But when they decide that their position makes them too smart to ever believe in Christ, then they're always going to remain in Adam and they're always going to promote everything except being in Christ. So science is not some neutral entity that weighs everything wisely and then gives us the, the intelligent result and conclusion. Uh, there are, that's, there's, that doesn't exist. That doesn't exist. Um, so to, to try to harmonize our reading of the Bible with science is fraught with danger. Our commitments to the Word of God is the author authoritative source regarding the origins of mankind and the universe. Since all Scripture is breathed out by God, it's foundational in the Christian faith that we read every word of Scripture as God's authoritative word to us. If we deny the authority of Scripture at one point, we've denied it everywhere. Scripture cannot be broken. Jesus said that in John 10, 35. Now, that's, that's, our, that's what we have in our doc, doctrinal distinctives on creation. Uh, but there are a lot of implications of that, and we want to talk about some of that today in light of some of the things that's been going on. Before we move to that more specifically, does anybody have a question or a comment about what we've talked about so far? Brother Roger. We would, we would say that a day is a 24-hour day also, correct? That's what we teach, and we teach it because when Moses wrote Genesis, he went out of his way, even though it is true that the Hebrew word yom for day can mean a 24-hour period or it can mean a, an age uh, we get the, we use it the same way in English. We say, back in my day, which when we say that, nobody thinks, well, let me get my calendar out, and I want you to specify which 24-hour day you're talking about. Nobody does that because we know. Okay, so it can be used in that way, but if we have a phrase that says something like, there was evening and there was morning the first day. Okay, when we have that phrase, it becomes clear what's being communicated. The only reason to move away from that is to accommodate science. And the thing is, 
there are scientists who are believers and there are scientists who are unbelievers. And in both categories, um, well, in the believer category, even there are multiple positions on this, but we're not trying to do science. We're trying to arrive at truth. And we believe that the Bible is a perfect record of truth for us. It is a, a presentation of truth. And for that reason, we don't have any interest in accommodating it with the views of science. Now, if the Bible tells us things like there are four moons around the earth and people can fly uh, and that the, that the uh, <clears throat> our atmosphere is made up primarily of lead, if the Bible said things like that, then we would just, we would be, it would be disqualified, wouldn't it? Because we would say the correspondence with reality is so off. We just can't, we, you know, we can't, we can't take it seriously. Well, that's kind of like the other books that claim to be biblical, uh, the Word of God, except the Bible. The Bible doesn't have any of that kind of stuff. Mr. K. Uh, this, uh, and you said that uh, Genesis 1 and the verse uh, 5, there is uh, uh, evening and there was morning. But uh, this uh, evening and morning may be the different of uh, our concept because uh, the sun was made the fourth day. So then that uh, uh, this first day there is no sun and moon. So it means that uh, not the sunset and the sunrise because the sun is not there. So maybe this is a defined concept. Well, certainly we have the concept of evening, but what this teaches us is that God doesn't need a sun and a moon to call something an evening. Uh -huh. He doesn't need a sun and a moon for there to be light. That the sun and the moon are not the universal cosmic sources of light. They are sources of light, but God doesn't need them in order to be light because he created light first. Um, now, if there were no such thing as God and nothing supernatural, that'd be an issue because we'd know, well, there's got to be a source for the light. But throughout scripture, we saw, we know that God not only creates light, but we're told that he is light. So, so he's, he knows that when, when Moses wrote this, when the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to, to write this, he knew that when he said, evening to humans, humans wouldn't go, evening, hmm, what is evening? He knew that humans would know what an evening followed by a morning is. And that's, that's why I'm convinced he's, con he's communicating that he, he, meant, he means for us to understand it's in a 24-hour period. Does he need 24 hours in order to do that? He doesn't. He doesn't. Um, did he do? Are there, are there things in the Bible that point back to this to be a pattern? Yes, the work week for, for Israel, as, as God gave it, the law, they had a work week and they were supposed to have a day of rest. God doesn't need a rest physically, but I think He's establishing a pattern. And so I don't think that there are other things to go into in this text and latch on to to come up with anything other than God meant to to tell us that these days, this use of the word yom is the same way we'd use it when there, when he says there's an evening and a morning somewhere else, even though there's not a sun and a moon. So that that's important for us to recognize that. Um, you, you made the statement that um, the only reason to go outside of a 24 hour period would be to align with science, but I just looking at the wording of it, and as, as um, this gentleman mentioned, it seems like to try to correlate the wording, sometimes it would be, I guess, make more sense that it was a period of time rather than a rotation of the planet. And so to, <clears throat> in our current English language, we say the morning or the evening of something is the beginning or the ending. I know the ancient Hebrew, I don't think it does that. But I see how people could try to correlate the wording of it, and maybe it's an era or a epoch rather than just a 24-hour rotation of the Earth. Right. We have to get away from the rotation of the Earth, because that's not here. Yeah. What is here is an evening and a morning. Yeah. And those words have meanings. And there's, I'm unaware of philosophical meanings of evening and morning. I'm unaware of those. That's, that's the day age. <clears throat> right. And 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 what we need to say is it's not necessarily a, a salvation or a f fellowship issue. Uh, there are people who articulate the gospel very well 
if you don't believe in this. Uh, but I can, good conscience, do anything except take it as its surface level meaning. Because I don't, there's nothing. Well, we know God can, God can do it in a 24 hour period, but I know some people wrestle with it. Or is that, is it the ending of a period and the beginning of a period, the morning and the evening, or the evening and the morning? And so it's one of those things where you said fellowship. Um, we teach that it's 24 hours. But it's, we got to acknowledge, some people might struggle with that, even outside of the scientific realm, just because of the wording, and they're trying to make sense of the wording. Well, I think people would, I think what people are struggling with is ex nihilo creation, which means 24 hours is infinitely more time than God needs to create any, yeah. infinitely more things than we can imagine. So, so we're not talking about what's reality. Now let's compare the text to our understanding of reality. We don't have an understanding of reality except this. That's what. That's my position. This is the yeah. testimony to the reality. Yeah. Yes, How sir. How do you not have a morning and night without their rotation? I don't understand. Um, well, we know that technically now, the reason we have an evening and the reason we have a morning is because of the rotation of the planet. But we clearly have evening and morning before the planet, before the sun and the moon. Uh, so it's... What he means when he says evening and morning cannot be telling us the position of the sun and the moon because they don't exist yet. So he has to be telling us something time related. Uh, and so I, I don't think we have a lot to go on because science, can only, science is limited to the observable and the only observer of this was God. And so God then told Moses what to tell us. And he said, and there was an evening and a morning on the first day. So I think that's more time related than it is uh, uh, physics related, if that makes sense. My question is, if no one struggles with in the beginning God, but then a few sentences later they start struggling with this. So what, what does that tell me? Yeah, I think we... It's right to try to understand it. It's right to try to understand it. But it, we don't have to. We're not obligated to understand it according to our current situation, which is what science is going to do. Science is going to look at how does it happen now. Okay, then. Well, here's what we can define about the text. But by what we know in the text, you can't do that because all the, all the entities involved did not exist yet. Casey? I was just going to bring up... Uh you know, obviously when we're looking at this, we must remember sola scriptura, so scripture alone. Right. And so a lot of us, when we were younger, we got taught something in the school district, we got taught something that we, what scientists told us, but the reality is we're all looking at the same thing. It just matters what lens we're looking at it to where if you are not saved, your, if your lens is obviously it's not the scripture, so you don't put that scripture on your eyes to look at it. You're looking at things through the world. And so, and I know that this probably wouldn't be used by many people, but one thing that I think is concrete for us when we look at scripture about a six day, 24 hour period is specifically God has given us genealogies. And in those genealogies, we have the exact time frame of how long Adam lived. How many, how many days he was on the planet? How many years he was on the planet? And some people would argue different things, but so if, it, if those days were different, when did that genealogy start for Adam? Mm -hmm. Did it change? Did it? And so right. not that those genealogies were put there for that specific purpose. However, we can look at creation specifically and mm -hmm. say, Especially when we see the word day, we don't challenge any other time day is used in the Old Testament. Many people want to argue about that one occurrence right. in, in creation. So, Well, even in the account of creation, when the summation of all of it was completed, in that day God created, it had the period of the seven days described as one day. So that's where I think... Other than outside of the scientific realm, people are just looking at the wording and they're trying to say, is this 
what it is. And so they're... What are the implications for saying it's not what it is? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. What are the implications for concluding? Mm -hmm. We see what the words are. It says evening and morning, but it wasn't. Well, how far do you go? Because here, here, let me answer that question. The theology of salvation is connected to this. And this second, starting at death, entered creation, the result of the sin of Adam and Eve, that's the crucial issue. Let me show you a couple places. And this one is related to something I actually wanted us to emphasize today. And we can, we don't have a deadline on these things, so we can revisit these issues uh, uh, and to go as slow as we want to going through, the, through this. But I want you to look at uh, Matthew. When we start, when we, when we observe what we see now and begin to impose that on the, the biblical text, which inevitably ends up, well, then it was longer, it was longer. <clears throat> it was longer. Uh, then we have gaps. I mean, that's actually the name of a theory, the gap theory, that there's a big gap here. But when Jesus talked about it, I think he talked about it from the perspective that, that I've described right here. Um, was there any period between... Was there some long age between Genesis 1-1 and when, uh, when God created Adam and Eve? If there was, what did it look like? Now, science would say, of course there was. First of all, there was no Adam and Eve. Secondly, yes, billions of years and just cycles of life and death. But here's what Jesus said, Matthew 3. I'm sorry, not Matthew 3. Um, Matthew. Okay. I don't have my notes with me there. Did I take that out? No, here we go. I got it. Everybody remain calm. <laughs> Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Um, Matthew 19, 3. Pharisees had their own take on things that were in the Bible. The Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Does that sound like he is taking the Genesis account of creation as kind of as a a rapid level of creation. There's not ages from the time that God made uh, other things and then He made man. It seems. I mean, He's saying from the beginning, God made man. God made Adam and Eve. So now we can cancel out all the theories that include a big age. And certainly all of the ones that say that, well, Adam and Eve were the first, maybe, humans with a soul. Um, because this says he, from the beginning, he created them male and female. And we, we have them named in Genesis. So I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I cannot in good conscience try to cram an age in there. And so when we take it surface level, and we say we two things that are reasonable and everybody has done heard it in their life. Sometimes the word day is meant as an age and sometimes it means a 24 hour period. Now look, when we look at 24 hours, now we can talk maybe and say, is that exactly how long it was? I don't know, but in order to help us understand, he gave us these two concepts, evening and morning. Does that make you, make us think that when he's using the word day, we should think more like, I kind of know what a day is when it has an evening and a morning. And, and yes, technically we know why we have that. We, he made the machinery to make us have that in the sun, the moon, and all the universe, the planets and all that. But he didn't have to have those things in order to communicate to us an evening and a morning. And that's what he communicated. An evening is a time of day. Uh, morning is time of day. In fact, the first, a lot of the people who heard this probably didn't even think about the mechanism of it. They just knew it gets dark and it gets light. 
you know, uh, and we still use the perspective to describe the sun rise. That's our perspective. So if there was a gap, we've, we've got Jesus in a bad spot here because he says beginning, he made the male and female, and he's talking about marriage. So it's not some pre-human race of beings because they he's talking about humans capable of being married. From the beginning, he made the male and female. And then Romans 5 is... Uh, who are the people who's, who is the man whose sin made the rest sinners? Romans 5, 19 is by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So we've got Jesus saying, uh, Adam was made from the beginning. That means it's compressed. <laughs> it's not ages later. It's from the beginning. And then we've got information in Romans 5 that talk about death entering creation. Romans 5, 12, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. So there was no sin before Adam and Eve's sin, which means there was no death before Adam and Eve's sin, which means there they are the first people, um, and they were from the beginning. I don't know how to take this. What I'm telling you right now is not my preference. It's not my preference. I don't know how to preach the gospel consistently with a bunch of ages in between the days of creation because of the two things we just talked about. If there was death in the world before sin, then Romans 5 is wrong. Okay, all the models I've seen of old earth stuff include death in the world before sin. Unless I'm misunderstanding it. So, so that's, that's the issue there. With that, yes, Debbie. Well, maybe there's a lot of smarter people in this room than me, but I know that my human brain can't possibly comprehend the power of God. And this is the power of God. I mean, people aren't questioning that he created a man. Look at the perfection of a human body from the earth. We don't question that. But we can't comprehend his power. I can't even comprehend the word eternity, never mind the, right. out, the power right. to create an earth. So I'm so grateful I can just look at his words and not look for hidden meaning and just take his words as he wants me on this earth in this human body to understand right. creation. That's a good point. We don't have to look for hidden meaning. That's true. We, we just need to receive what's clear. Um, I think it was Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, uh, and I don't believe... I'm not... I'm not saying whatever he says about the Bible is great. I'm just telling you, he said something I think is worth thinking about when he said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that trouble me, it's the parts I do understand. <laughs> so, um, now look, <clears throat> with all this said, some of, I could name you some theologians that I hold in high regard. I believe, I believe that they are fully committed to the gospel, excellent preachers of the gospel, and they did not agree with what I just said about Genesis 1. I can't make it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't go and tell people the gospel with what I just shared about sin and death and all that. Uh, I can't. So that's that's what it comes down to. I don't see a way to do it. Um, John MacArthur puts this at the very first of their statement of faith mm -hmm. at Grace Community. And his comment is, the reason we do this is we want people to see that we are perfectly consistent in how we interpret Scripture. That's important. Because depending on how you interpret this will define how you what you do with Scripture after that. I think that's a very important. That's one of the reasons that I can't, I can't go any other direction with this. I'm not saying, I just told you, I, there are some people that I love that don't agree with with, with our distinctive. 
and that's fine. And you don't have to agree with it to be a member of our church. But uh, this is what will be taught because I, I would violate my conscience to do otherwise because I don't see a way to be consistent. I don't see a way. And you're stuck with me right now. <laughs> so so that's... Uh, well, even, even those that question the wording and think, well, maybe God meant something a little different. If it comes down to it, could God have meant this? Could God have meant it this way? Yes. So what you're teaching, even if the wording may, somebody could think it a little different, what, taking the literal route, what we're proclaiming in our statement of faith is absolutely true and absolutely biblical. Yeah, it's definitely <coughs> biblically, it's consistent with what we read in the oh, Bible. Yeah. So that's an important point. And the other thing I would say is, if somebody wants to argue about this while you're trying to share the gospel with them, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think that's an. Uh, I would say don't do that. Stay on the gospel. Stay on. Uh, yeah, whatever questions you have about that. Here's the thing. You're here right now. That's always a good one. By the way, when people bring up the what about the innocent guy in the jungle, uh, you can just avoid that whole trap by saying, "Yeah, God, God will handle." everybody else but we're we're i'm not talking to him i'm talking to you and by the way all the innocent people will be fine the problem is that the many which means and when it says the many it's two categories adam and the many <coughs> that's everybody right adam and his descendants so there is no innocent guy in the jungle but that's i wouldn't want to get bogged down in that just you know there's in, all the innocent people will be fine, but are you innocent? <laughs> and the answer to that is a no. And there are no innocent people since Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were innocent, and then they sinned, and they were no longer innocent. So I do want to touch on this, on this day particularly in our last uh, few minutes. You're going to hear more about this uh, in the worship meeting. But uh, today, many churches in Canada... And uh, because of what they were doing, many churches in North America today are kind of making a cl making their stand on a biblical view of uh, sexuality and marriage and gender. And so back in Genesis chapter 1, we read it from Matthew 19, but Genesis 1, 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. How many genders are did God create for the purpose of creating mankind in his image? Two. There are two. Up until recent years, when someone was born with a genetic problem, it was considered a problem. Because the standard was there's male and there's female. And everything started from that and went to line, do what was possible medically to line people up with that. But now, according to some sources who claim to be science, uh, I guess there's an infinite number. <laughs> I guess, I don't know, I keep hearing the number increase, but God says there's two. God says there's two, and if, and if there's a blurring of that, and people, listen, people are born with, with uh, problems, medical problems, in which there's a blurring, which it's, uh, the, 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 the reality so far as this person is, is De developing as a baby we need to work and they worked toward male or female but they it was considered something to work on and uh it's not just medical now they've left the realm of medical and biological realities and just people's own opinions but god has an opinion uh so so there's that and there's also genesis 2 24 Genesis 2, 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Okay, so there's, there's the plan for marriage. Today, 
pastors in Canada, many of them agreed to preach on this topic or to, to at least address this topic because in Canada, Bill C-4 passed their parliament and got royal assent and went into law, I think maybe uh, this past week. And it's, it bans conversion therapy. Now we're not saying that there's not some practices in psychology or even psychiatry that may be coercive or, you know, I mean, certainly that has happened in the history of the world. Banning criminal practice, we're for. But, it, but conversion therapy got defined so broadly that it includes counseling people to move toward what their biological uh, gender is. That is criminal. It could be, it's easy to read it and see, oh, a, a church... For example, if, if somebody was struggling with gender identity, uh, say a, a, a young a teenager or something, and their parents brought them to a church, a biblically faithful pastor or counselor has only one thing to go to, and that's the Word of God, which is going to say he made them male and female. Uh, and... He made them male and female. But that bill leaves that open to criminal prosecution to, to say that in a counseling setting, maybe even in a pulpit. It's important enough that they said, we've got to address this now. Let's go on record and say we're not going to stop preaching what the Word of God says. And then pastors in the United States agree to say, yeah, we want to join you in that and show unity in that. So... Uh, so today, during part of our service, I'll read that Matthew 19 passage and a couple of others. Um, this is the reason why we can't take our standpoint and look at reality and interpret Genesis 1 or any other passage of Scripture based on, well, it seems to me that. And what we have to do is be relentless to say, what do the words say? Let's don't go beyond that, but let's say at least what those say. That's the safe place to be um, because if you start with what it seems like from your standpoint, that's subjective. And uh, it's since the Bible teaches after Adam and Eve fall, we are sinners by nature. That standpoint is never going to be accurate and to a degree that would be helpful. So, are people being born with, are people growing up and, and having gender confusion? I would never deny that. There's some confusion going on. Is that inherently who they are made to be? If the Bible is true, it's not. And so to, we help them by using the biblical standard of male and female. And here's what we're called to be as Biblical manhood and biblical womanhood are real and discernible from the Bible, and we're to honor God by moving people in that direction. If that becomes criminal, then we'll just have to go to jail over it. And it seems like it, because we don't have the option to, okay, well, let's, uh, let's bring it down on a notch. <laughs> down a notch from the truth leads to the lake of fire, right? That's all there is. You don't, you don't get, I'm not saying you lose your salvation. No, you can't lose your salvation. I'm just saying we either teach the truth or we don't. So does anybody have a question or comment about that? Oh, well, just, yeah. Mike, I just wanted to say, I don't need to throw confusion into this, but there's such a thing as scientism versus science. And, True. And uh, currently we're in the midst of scientism, you know. With the That's family. right. So, but uh, if the Bible is not a scientific treatise, no. when it speaks to science, it's true. Right. And in this case, it's speaking to biological science. And so uh, I pay attention to that. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. I guess we'll see you in jail, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... Uh, there. Here's, here's the sad thing. West Lafayette, Indiana 
their city, they have an ordinance that's basically pretty much the same thing that got passed by the federal government in Canada. They're considering. I don't know how that's gone. I haven't seen a result on that. But there's an example of a municipality in the United States, um, and you know they're they're looking at looking at banning conversion therapy. They're all saying that what they have in mind is the coercive, harmful things. You know, I'm not an expert on that. I'm not going to deny that it exists. But when they define it so broadly that it includes counsel, that God made humans male and female. And you're either male or female, and that's based on your biological birth. If that becomes criminal, you know, well. Well, up in Canada, if you look at the way the law is worded, it's telling that they can send the activists into the schools to try to convert the kids into the LGBT movement right. and to mm -hmm. convince the girls that they're boys and the boys that they're girls. Mm -hmm. But if they come out of that confused and they start asking questions, if you try to convince them, no, That's you're right. actually a boy or actually a girl, you can. it's against the law. So they can try to convert them to confusion, yeah. but you can't straighten them out. That's a good that's a good point and another reason why this is so dangerous and another reason that these churches and pastors have recognized we're no longer talking about that day that may come it is here it has come the laws are on the books and so instead of wait until somebody gets arrested they've just said let's just in a show of unity say to the world we can't change what we're saying because it's the Word of God. It's what the Word of God says. It's This is not political. Only in the sense of we love our King and He has ruined. He's told us what He's done. So, yes, Sarah. Aren't those laws also not only uh, condemning preaching or counseling, but aren't they also criminalizing prayer for somebody? Yes. If it's in a... If it's in a con yeah. The answer to that is yes. Now, I mean, silent prayer, nobody knows what you're doing. That, but if that, you, that is specifically stated yeah, in the law. Yeah, so that's included. Scott, did you have Okay. Um, Michael said silent prayer. <laughs> well, if they knew what you were saying. So, so, uh, so the debt, you know, wow, we've all thought about these possibilities and now it's here. Well, I just want to add something that science, uh, if it happens to be true, it's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. I'm with Augustine. I mean, we share virtue with pagans. That's true. Them. Yep. And we, if, if science, by God's common grace, if a, a man or woman comes up with something that's valid and true, it remains true. That's right. But the, the <laughs> fact is, because of sin has entered the world, uh, for example, that's why we have people that are born with uh, confusion about their identity. Mm -hmm. And we have all kinds of problems because of that. But exactly. That doesn't negate God's word. No. Now, this is our source. And when it is contradicted by claims in the world, we stick with this because it, we, that's what being a faithful steward is. And it's required from stewards that they be found faithful. That's what faithfulness looks like. That's why Paul wrote four letters from prison. And then 2 Timothy uh, from death row because he was faithful. Uh, look, the disciples were eyewitnesses. Apparently, it seems from history that 11 of them were martyred. And if they would have recanted about Jesus' resurrection, then maybe they would have been saved. And then John, they put John out on a rock. <laughs> so nobody had to hear his nonsense, you know, and he kept preaching. So uh, this is Christianity. What we're experiencing is what most Christians in the history of the world have experienced throughout. Uh, it's always been a problem. Most, of, most Christians in the history of the world have had a problem with their government persecuting them. So we're just becoming normalized in our in our Christianity. So we can you know what we'll we'll pick up we'll talk some more about creation, just make sure we're we're all on the same page there. Let me do make clear again. Uh, what we talked about today is not a standard for being a member of our church. Okay, it's just that's the distinctive 
um, that we have. So we do recognize some liberty of conscience on this because there are, there are words and there are people that have to think it through and look at this. And, uh, um, but we all have to agree God's word is true and we need to obey it. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, we're, if we have a few differences in understanding exactly what it means, that's kind of inevitable. Uh, I, I have close friends who I have large disagreements over certain doctrinal issues. And I'm sad that they're wrong, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know I'm still the thing so. Uh, so let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed and look forward to going into the worship and we'll uh, hear Casey preach and we're looking forward to that Father thank you for the truth of your word thank you uh, that your word is consistent uh, help us to understand it Lord uh, help us to be willing to to, to think and to, to adjust our, our thinking based on what's in your word, in the Bible. Uh, Lord, we pray for our sister churches in Canada, for their members, for their pastors. And I pray that today would have an impact on that nation to see that the people in your churches love you and obey you and will be faithful to you no matter what the consequences. And I pray that that would be true of churches here in our country and all around the world, Lord. Uh, We want to be unified, but the unity is not true biblical unity unless it's based on the truth. So help us and lead us. Help us to have joy in the midst of this and not to be mean-spirited Uh, but rather to pray for our enemies, Lord. So those who are working to criminalize this, I pray that you would pour out your grace, open their eyes, draw them to you, uh, and help them to see. May your will be done. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.